They say the monsters aren't real, that those who claim to see them are crazy or liars. But in the town of Archer's Peak, the truth is far more terrifying. Children are disappearing, a town is under siege, and only one woman, Erica Slaughter, cool name by the way, stands between humanity and a nightmare that defies imagination. Enter the world of Something is Killing the Children, where the shadows hunger and the truth is more deadly than fiction. Stay tuned and uncover the secrets that lurk just beneath the surface before this airs on Netflix, or if you happen to be watching this after it airs on Netflix, hey, that's cool too. Either way, let's explore Something is Killing the Children's universe. This is one of my favorite comics and I can't wait to see this adaptation on Netflix. Something is Killing the Children is a story about facing your fears, fighting for what's right, and finding the strength to stand up to even the scariest monsters. Another story that takes place in Something is Killing the Children's Universe is The House of Slaughter. The first story arc of House of Slaughter issue numbers 1 through 6 takes place a couple years before the events of Something is Killing the Children. It gives more of a backstory on a side character, Aaron, Erica Slaughter's handler, and it expands on the universe. I'll give you the skinny. Imagine a super secret school where kids train to become monster hunters. That's the House of Slaughter. It's full of dark secrets and scary challenges. And only the toughest students survive. So we meet Aaron, a student who's trying to prove himself. He gets picked on a lot, but he falls for a mysterious boy named Jace, who might be his enemy. Things get even more intense when a bunch of monsters attack the school. Aaron and his friends have to fight for their lives, and some of them don't even make it. We learn more about the House of Slaughter's creepy history and the terrifying monsters they hunt. Aaron discovers some shocking secrets about the order that runs the school, Order of the St. George, which we will go more into that later. He starts to question everything he thought he knew. In the latest issue, a little boy named Bait, who has no arms, has to fight a bunch of monsters all by himself. It's super intense and sad, but also really brave with the kid. You think you can handle the House of Slaughter? Here are some chilling details that have been revealed so far. The House of Slaughter's history is shrouded in mystery, but it's clear it has existed for centuries. Dedicated to hunting and killing monsters, the order that runs it has a long and bloody history with many gruesome practices. Students at the House of Slaughter endure harsh training to become monster hunters. They are pushed to their physical and psychological limits, and many don't survive. The House of Slaughter holds many secrets, including the true nature of the monsters they hunt, the origins of the Order, and the dark rituals they practice. The Order has been known to conduct unethical experiments on both humans and monsters. The full extent of their research is unknown, but it's clear they are willing to cross any line in pursuit of power. Yeah, pretty eerie, right? Can't wait for this to go on Netflix, but later in the video, we will go into more detail about these practices and the House of Slaughter's background. I did review the first arc of House of Slaughter on this channel. Feel free to check it out. Some people dig it, but something is killing the children is what does it for me. It tickles my fancy. Then there is the Book of Slaughter and the Book of Butcher. Before I go any further, we did do a few limited print rated comics exclusive covers of something is killing the children, cover artists by John Jang. Feel free to check out those covers after the video. We also did a book of Butcher limited print rated comics exclusive, limited to 500 in print cover as well. And you gotta admit, it does look pretty cool, doesn't it? Now let's get back into the content. Next we have the Book of Slaughter. Book of Slaughter is a double sized one shot that takes place in the world of something is killing the children. As the series has grown and branched out, we have learned little things about the secretive order of St. George and a few of their houses around the world. This is a book that puts more of the world into perspective for us. I would not recommend it as a jumping point, but for the reader has become fascinated by the premise of the books, this is a terrific addition to add to your collection. The story opens in winter, around Christmas time, and we see Maxine, a white mask, sitting in her room looking at a bloody black mask. I promise we will go into the details what the color mask mean, but now the twins, Tybal and Paris, barge into the room to mock her about a decision she is considering. The bloody black mask is Aaron's, and the twins reminisce about how fun it was to tease him in front of the younger children. Bro was getting teased a lot in House of Slaughter. Maxine was in Archer's Peak when Aaron was killed. Cecilia, the head of the white mask, asked Maxine to ride with her back home. Maxine is keeping Aaron's mask as a souvenir even though she did not know him well. Cecilia talks about the differences between the white and black mask, and we learn that she originally was a black mask herself. The white masks, she explains, must be able to shrug off individual deaths and remember that they work for the collective purpose. A black mask does not have that luxury. They need to be able to care and to care deeply. 
She believes that Erica will not return to the house of slaughter and she was their sole black mask. But a house needs a black mask in order to survive. You'll have to read Something is Killing the Children series to get the full context why Erica Slaughter denounced the house of slaughter. But we did cover every issue of Something is Killing the Children on this channel. Feel free to binge, a brother don't mind. Maxine does her research. She convinces Benny and Azure Mask to dig up Erica's hunting information. He knows his information is closely kept and that an assassin from another order has been brought in to hunt her. Her statistics show a remarkable number of monster kills over six months. He explains that she would do the killing and Aaron would do the paperwork. In most houses, black masks have time off between kills to recover. Erica doesn't require that and that is strange to her. Next, Maxine heads for the library to read the book of slaughter. She is making sure she understands the rules and expectations for the order. And that's where things get interesting and we know a whole lot of info and backgrounds. We get a mix of some things that we have seen before and some we have not about the great secret. And then we also know how the children are selected to be the next monster hunters and the meaning of mask rankings. So the book starts off like this. We are the keepers of the great secret. Evil walks around this world, preying on those pure of heart enough to perceive it. That evil must be hunted and eliminated from the face of the earth. We are those hunters, fortified by the rituals of our forebearers. In the name of the Saint George, we will protect the innocent. So the selection process is this. It has been long known that children possess the purity of soul and mind to perceive the evil that preys upon them and that these dreaded monsters are drawn to and feed upon powerful emotions. No man feels as powerfully as a child and that they perceive the monsters makes them the most enticing prey. In the early days of the order, the first hunters would take the rare children with the instinct to survive a monster's attack. And what makes it even better is the children have managed to injure or kill the monster that threatened their life. But in the modern world, those children are too rare to fill their ranks. Instead, orphan children such as Erica Slaughter are tested and sorted based on the traits the order deems best suited for the life of a hunter. These children have a coldness to them so that they will not be needlessly burdened by the death they must witness. Once selected for induction, they must test who they really are, that they may understand their inner strength so they can best survive the house that has selected them. Then there's their totem. This is the most ancient and arcane of all traditions in the Order of the St. George is keeping of the totem. It's an object of powerful significance to the child selected to join the order, most often a remnant of the child's life before being orphaned, bound to the essence of a powerful monster. The object must have been loved by the child for the binding ritual to take effect. Without that protection, the starved monster bound within the totem might break free and feast upon its jailer. So the children to the order will spend their life working in symbiosis with the monster within their totem. As they train, they will learn many secrets of the monsters and they will shape their monster into the aspect of themselves. As they take on many of the attributes of the monsters itself, this partnership is sacred. And if severed, many hunters do not survive. Once a hunter has died, the totem is retired and the monster inside is destroyed. It is notable how few of these monsters resist their own destruction as if their will to survive ceases upon the death of the human to which they were bound. So we know how these children are selected, but how are they initiated? This process is called the sacrament of initiation. The first sacrament of St. George, a child must first abandon their family name and previous identity, swearing themselves to be a member of the order. Then to test that they have the inner strength to pursue this life, they are put face to face with a powerful monster, carrying nothing but their totem to protect them. The child is then induced into a powerful trance, at which point the monster is bound inside the totem and linked by the child's connection to the object. Inside the child's mind, the monster will attempt desperately to escape. If the monster succeeds, the bond to the totem and the child is severed and the monster is freed to feed upon the child. If the child succeeds, the monster is bound and trapped and forever linked to the hunter through their totem. In the early days of the order, hunters would bind the monster that orphaned the child selected. It was believed that it was only by overcoming a monster that inflicted deep emotional wounds in the child that a child could become a reliable hunter. But this process left many dead, incapable of passing the first sacrament of the St. George. In modern times, lesser monsters are bred and starved by the order specifically for the purpose of binding them to an inductee's totem so that more of them can survive to adulthood and keep the order strong and populated. Now we got the mark of the order. A young inductee having survived the sacrament of initiation and bound to their totem is marked with the symbol of the order of St. George. As a child grows and survives the further sacraments, the mark is repeated in the same spot, signifying a renewal of the young hunter's commitment to the order and recognition that once one is a member of the order, 
they are a member for life. Now they go through training and the hunter learns how to fight. The mask color of the recruit is dictated by which branch of the house recruited the child. So in Erica Slaughter's case, she was recruited by Black Mask Jessica. They are given training in weaponry, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and strategy as they learn to work in tandem with their totem. So the white mask. White masks are typically the largest branch of each house, requiring the most recruits. They are packed hunters trained to work together as a unit to bring down the largest monsters the order faces in its work. Black masks are the lone hunters of the Order of the St. George. They are trained to be self-sufficient in the field, capable of taking down a monster without a house assistance. The training is more rigorous, lonely work, and the heads of the Black Mask branch work diligently to only pick those suited to the solitary life required of them. Now some of these masks have teeth and some of them don't have teeth. And the way they earn their teeth is after killing a fully formed monster, a young hunter is given a new mask, bearing the teeth that mark their elevation within the house and their status as an apprentice under their superior. The teeth signify that the young hunter has learned the most important tenet of the Order of the St. George. To hunt monsters, one must become a monster. Now we did talk about in one of my reviews in Something is Killing the Children and that's the Sacrament of Trepanation. What they do is they drive a nail of gold through the skull that way as adults these hunters can still see the monsters because as kids they can see them but as adults it's going to be very hard to see them. The act of trepanation reopens the mind to what it could perceive in its youth and purity giving all servants of the Order of St. George a third eye allowing them to continue the great work of the Order until their dying day. Now pull from the ranks of the hunter apprentices from those who either either lack the fortitude to hunt on their own or those who exhibit traits that show they would best serve a different crucial aspect within the hierarchy of the house. We got the Scarlet Mask. Scarlet Masks are the keepers of the house and its records. They make sure that the house is kept in pristine condition, feeding its hunters, washing their clothes, cleaning their rooms. They also oversee the library of each house, recording each hunter's missions and documenting the different classes of monsters the hunters face in their work so that the house can learn from its past mistakes and rise above them in the future. They write in the blood of monsters so that only members of the order can read their work. The majority of those who do not participate in the blind hunt will become Scarlet Mask. Now what is a blind hunt you may ask? It is a test before the final sacrament of the St. George. It's the most vicious and deadly. In other words, you're killing a monster blind, blindfolded, you ain't seeing nothing. Next we have Azure Masks. Azure Masks are the weaponeers of the order. In ancient times, they crafted the tools by which hunters would hunt and kill the monsters they face in the wild. The Azure Masks have become the spy masters of the order. It is their duty above all others to prevent the wider world from learning of their existence of monsters and the machinations of the Order of St. George. They infiltrate law enforcement, politics, and news organizations at their highest levels, keeping their secret a great secret. There's also Silver Masks. Silver masks are the specialist hunters of the Order of St. George. In ancient times, the silver masks were a large aspect of the Order. As larger percentages of the population believe in specific types of monsters, vampires, werewolves, changelings, and all matters of dark creatures, as these monsters were supplanted by raw, amorphous monsters formed by baser fears, the silver mask work became less plentiful and fewer hunters made the decision to ride up to the position. As it stands, each house must have at least two silver masks, a master and an apprentice to keep the tradition alive. Next we got the emerald masks. Emerald masks are the highest class of monster hunter within the order of the St. George and require the most training. They are the dragon hunters. There are two ways to earn an emerald mask. One requires being chosen to train as a silver mask, rising to the status of master at that rank, then undergoing years of training at the great house of St. George. The other requires finding and killing a dragon in the wild. Dragons are born from mankind's most primal and powerful emotions and most form in societies with a deep cultural belief in dragons. There are a few dragons left in the world today and even fewer emerald masks. Then you have the council. Each house within Order of the St. George is overseen by a council consisting of the most senior members of each branch of the house to make certain decisions to make certain that no unnecessary conflicts arise between the different mask colors. Should a house have any within their ranks, seniority is the primary judge of who is admitted to the council, but occasionally an exceptional member of a branch is given the seat at the table over its most senior member. If agreed upon by the full council, each council is overseen by the head of each house who bears a ceremonial gold mask and it's given the title of the dragon. Now speaking of the dragon, in the early days of the order, only members of the Order of St. George who achieved the status of Emerald Mask were given the sanction to start their own house and take the title of 
the dragon. If the central tenet of the Order of St. George is that one must become a monster to hunt monsters, it followed that only one who has killed dragons could take the title of dragon. In modern age, the rules have loosened because dragons just don't exist like that. I mean, they do, but very few. So upon the death of a house leader, the council puts forth a name from within their ranks of who they see fit to rule them. If granted the role of emissaries of the great house of St. George, they rise to the station of gold mask and are bestowed the title of the dragon. So now we got the house. Each house within the order of St. George oversees a geographic region as determined by the great house of St. George. Within that region, they hold the responsibility of maintaining the secret of monsters existence, the elimination of monsters and the maintenance of their house and their members. Should they fail, the charter of the house can be revoked and its hunters must either forswear their house and join another or they would be hunted down and eliminated like they would do if they were hunting down a monster. Each house is permitted to develop its own rights and customs as long as it holds to the three sacraments and fulfills its responsibilities. Now here we get an idea of which each house of slaughter and the great house is located at geographically speaking. You can take a look at that, screenshot if you like, or just take a mental picture. And then we got the Dragon King, which I have not seen at all in this comic, but maybe they're going to introduce that in the later issue. The spiritual leader of the Order of St. George and the head of the Great House of St. George, his will is law within our order, and his decisions dictate the continuation of their deepest traditions. The Dragon King is selected by the heads of the Congregation of Houses upon the death of the previous Dragon King. He is the keeper of St. George's history and they do their work in solemn tribute to his glorious missions. Now we have the Book of Butcher. I did mention we have a limited print Rated Comics exclusive cover limited to 500 in print on our website, ratedcomics.com. Yeah, of course I did. Let's get into how this ties into Something is Killing the Children Universe before it airs on Netflix. Book of Butcher is a double-sized issue that blends a solid story with an incredible amount of additional world building. We know more tidbits about the Order of St. George and it's awesome to find out more. Just enough to help us understand some of the Order's conflicts. The issue opens up in a Louisiana bayou where a bleeding Maxine walks back to the house where Louis Butcher sits on the steps. She sets down her hatchets and grabs a beer. She did not kill the monster. Louis asked her if she's given up. Already we can see that their relationship is prickly. He'd rather just have her leave, enough of this, or just die, but she was sent there to learn from him and he has not done anything helpful. He apparently believes she needs to learn by doing and he does not think highly of Slaughter. There is a flashback to Cecilia's discussion with Maxine about Luis. Cecilia has met him and was not impressed, but he is the only black mask in the country who has killed more monsters than Erica. Well, he has some conflict with them, so he stays out in the swamp. But even the Grey House sends people over there to learn from him from time to time. Another day, Maxine comes back injured. That's her other day of training. So Louis asks if she knows how to stitch herself up. She does, but the angle is awkward on this one. He hands her a book to read and tells her not to bleed on the pages. At this point, we learn that there's a book of Butcher. The original was destroyed in a fire, but a Scarlet Mask had memorized it and rewrote it. This is our transition to that book and its information about the monsters. Before we had names, we had monsters. For as long as we have thinking minds and for as long as we have dreamed, monsters have sprung forth from them. It is with this understanding we know that our monsters predate our civilizations and may in fact have helped spur them on. Any rational scholar of monstrum must first understand that it's humanity that gives them their power. Monsters, it is known that they are fear incarnate. Every dreadful ability, strength, and weakness comes from the human mind and its capacity to imagine then fear. We shape our monsters from the day we are born until the day we die. And we pity the soul who fear catches up to them. That's all in the book? Man, this is some deep stuff right here. For nothing inspires humanity like fear. What this does is create a unique symbiotic relationship between humanity and its horrors. For there will always be monsters and so there must always be those who hunt. So we start off with the Oscar type monsters. It is believed that humanity's original monsters are Oscar types. Shadowy monsters manifested from vague, generalized fears and anxieties. Before we named our fears or constructed superstitions, these were the nightmares we faced. Their populations eventually dwindled with the rise of civilization and folklore. However, as belief in superstitions decreased, Oscar type manifestations increased once more. Fear needs to go somewhere. Fear needs to become something. By the turn of the 21st century, Oscar type populations rose to a record all time high, which is still ongoing at the time of this transcription. It's a strange but fascinating scenario where Oscar types were the monsters we face when we knew nothing and now they are the monsters they face when they know so much. Oscar type monsters are unique from all other monsters. 
Their shadow forms make them especially difficult to kill as they only solidify while eating or attacking, and that was established in Something is Killing the Children. The Oscar type is also capable of living a full life cycle, not dissimilar to natural beasts. While most manifest in a sizable adult form, they are capable of growing larger with their kills and as fear continues to flourish in their environment, these monsters are also capable of breeding if left to develop too long. This unique ability to spawn children sees the arrival of infant Oscar types, litters which then also grows exponentially with their kills and by siphoning local fear. This makes the Oscar type many houses favorite monster to procure and multiply for training purposes. When Oscar types are left to fester for too long, they will continue to develop towards gigantic proportions. This is, of course, a rare case and would be seen as a direct failure of the Order of St. George and the local chapter as Oscar types at this size can become visible to adult populations, spelling calamity. Then you got the anatype. If the Oscar type was the original monster, then the anatype follows soon after. These monsters manifest from the fears of the very real beasts that roam our planet, taking on a heightened form of the animal which inspired it. Since anatypes assume the characteristic of their respective animal, this generally makes them the easiest of the monster to hunt and kill. So it's just pretty much Oscar types mixed with animals, that's all. Then we got the duplicit type. While the anima type emerges from the fear of animals, the duplicit type manifests from the fear of humans. These monsters are specific in the replica as they are inspired by human danger and take the shape of known individuals. Duplicit types are also highly reactive in nature and can take on various human forms across their life cycle. The most dangerous of their qualities may be their ability to improve their replication with every kill. Their initial imitations often emerge shifty and incomplete, but the duplicit type is capable of honing their image and developing human biology until the replica is near identical. At this point, the duplicit type begins to gain the ability to communicate, which is no doubt a worst case scenario for the order. The most common of the duplicit types take the form of known relatives or acquaintances in a child's life whom they fear. It's not rare for a child's abuser to suddenly be duplicate type, you know, taking on even deadlier form. A hunter's first step must then be a sufficient background check into any victim's history of abuse. Another persistent cause is a duplicit type bred from the fears of notorious criminals, particularly whichever one frequents the current news cycle. Serial killers and copycat murders multiplying are notable clues for hunters to consider. These monsters are most often found within a large eyeball at their gut, which is their presumed means of scanning and replication. This is a common duplicit type, otherwise known as the duplicit type oculus. Now meanwhile, the duplicit type doppelganger develops from the fear of self. These monsters take their creator's image and then haunt their human twin, feeding off their fear and dark emotions until the replica is complete. The doppelganger will then proceed to devour their prime human and assume their place. A rather sad and exceptional variation of the duplicit type, it's known as a changeling. These monsters materialize from the fears of new parents and are one of the few monsters that adult humans can see from inception. Their first victim is the baby they replace, before slowly feeding on their caretakers. To this day, not much is known about changelings and more research must be done. I know that was a lengthy video, but that is pretty much Something is Killing the Children Universe explained between Something is Killing the Children, House of Slaughter, Book of Slaughter, and Book of Butcher. And by the way, don't forget to check out RatedComics.com for some really cool exclusives and our Something is Killing the Children exclusive, not to mention our Book of Butcher exclusive. So now you understand the Something is Killing the Children Universe before it airs on Netflix, and I hope you enjoyed the content. Now for more videos like this, and if you like the content we're throwing up, you know what to do. Like the video and subscribe to this channel. Also, this video is sponsored by coffee, so if you'd like to buy your boy a cup of coffee, link in description or donate to the super thanks. But the greatest compliment you guys can do is by liking this video and subscribing to Rated Comics YouTube channel. Thank you again for watching. Until next time.